Happy October and welcome back to another spooky video. Scooby-Doo has always been one of my favorite franchises. I get so much enjoyment out of both the original series and the many adaptations of it. I think many others can say the same. The success of this series is undeniable. A group of detectives who solve mysteries with their talking dog, always going up against a monster that turns out to be some guy in a mask. It really went to show that a formulaic plot could work if the series was enjoyable enough. And seriously, who doesn't love the members of Mystery Inc.? They're some of the greatest characters in all of fiction. Scooby-Doo started as a cartoon series in 1969 and only grew in popularity from there. With how many different shows, movies, games, and merchandise this franchise had, it wasn't surprising when it received a live-action movie in 2002. Two years later, they made a sequel called Monsters Unleashed. Both of these movies were critically panned. The critics weren't big fans of the humor or storytelling. And Monsters Unleashed even won a Razzie Award for Worst Remake or Sequel. But you know who did like these movies? The audience. In recent years, many fans who grew up with these films have expressed how much they appreciate them. As children, many of us didn't care what the critics had to say. If we saw a movie we liked, Roger Ebert wasn't gonna stop us from enjoying it. I'll admit, when I was a kid, I only ever saw the first movie a few times when it aired on Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. But the sequel, let me tell you. I owned a physical copy of the second movie, and it was one of my favorite things to watch. It was playing on my TV almost every other day. I found it so fascinating, and I still quote jokes from it on a regular basis. Unfortunately, when I started to grow a little older and saw that people didn't like these movies, I felt bad for ever enjoying them. I was still a kid and assumed my opinion was wrong, so I kind of buried the thoughts of ever enjoying these movies until I saw that other people shared the same opinion. Even the same story a lot of the time. I'm glad we now live in a world where I can openly reference these movies and not feel bad about it. I actually still have the old VHS tape that I used to watch all the time. Wait, from Blockbuster? Uh, so should I return it, or...? So with how much I enjoyed the movie, it made sense that I would find interest in a video game based on it. I grew up with a good few Scooby-Doo games, most notably Unmasked, Night of a Hundred Frights, and Mystery Mayhem. I loved all three of these games more than I could ever tell you. But this one was on the PC, so even though I had moved onto video game consoles by the time I discovered it, the thought of playing another Scooby-Doo game brought me right back to my computer. Would you believe I found this game in Aldi? Yeah, I guess Aldi was selling computer games for a time. But take a wild guess as to which company developed this. Yep, it's our favorite 2000s PC game developer, good ol' AWE. I couldn't escape these guys in my childhood. This came out in 2004, which means it wasn't the first AWE game to feature a talking dog. Is it dangerous? AWE games could best be described as the gaming equivalent of the movie Hoodwinked. You can tell the developers put effort into their work and the games were often entertaining, but they just didn't have the budget to do their vision the full justice it deserved. We've gone through their many Spongebob games on this channel, and I know I talk about them a lot, but keep them in the back of your mind for this video, they'll be relevant later. But enough about that, I think it's time we look into the PC adaptation of Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. First, I think we need our own canine companion to walk through this game with us. You want to play this game, Scoob? Is it dangerous? Grace, what the heck? The game starts by showing the official trailer for the movie itself. We'll be reminded throughout the game to check out the movie on our own. Sure, let me go pop the VHS from Blockbuster in. The game starts with the same plot of the movie. Surprising, I know. The members of Mystery Inc. pull up to a museum in their mystery machine limousine. That's fun to say. And they're interviewed by reporter Heather Jasper Howe. The museum is being opened in Coolsville, and the members of Mystery Inc. are donating the costumes of the many monsters they've unmasked. I guess they were allowed to keep the costumes after exposing all those criminals. It is nice to see all the characters that were from the old Scooby-Doo episodes, though. So after some dialogue lifted directly from the movie, fully voice acted by the film cast nevertheless, we get into the gameplay. Every so often, we get these point-and-click segments where we move Shaggy and Scooby to different screens. If you click around, you can find clues in the form of little animations. Once you find all the clues on the screen, you unlock a photo from the movie. I also gotta say, the animation is decent for a 2000s computer game. I like the character models, and it's oddly pleasing to look at. Of course, you don't have to search for clues, but it's a fun little pastime. The animations get more interesting as the game goes on. 
Once you enter the museum, the gang members discuss the monsters of the past by reciting dialogue from the movie, very disappointed that Chickenstein doesn't make a later appearance in this game. Also, ignore the faulty textures on Fred's shirt. The plain white color didn't age well in AWE games. Blame technology for advancing. Oh, come on, guys. Remember what I told you. Never pick your nose in public. Oh, that line wasn't in the budget. So we then get a cool cinematic where the pterodactyl ghost comes to life. These cutscenes are really nice with smoother animation than the gameplay portions, but it is a little strange hearing everyone screaming while the pterodactyl's point of view shows us a mostly empty museum. I love how it just torments Velma for no reason before flying away. It makes a mess of the museum, steals the Black Knight costume, and flies away. Then this guy appears. Citizens of Coolsville! This is only the first rung on the ladder of your demise. And this time, Mystery Inc., you'll be the ones unmasked as the buffoons you truly are! <laughs> I love how he just walks out. No dramatic exit. Even evil monsters have to use the front door. So when we're thrown into our first minigame, we're bound to have a little instance of deja vu. Does this screen look familiar to you? That's because it's the same format AWE used for the minigame screens in Battle for Bikini Bottom. Even the first minigame is the same as the Raft game in Battle for Bikini Bottom. I mean, if they had the code, who could blame them for using it more than once? The minigame is also a typical game of Rush Hour, where you move obstacles out of the way for Scooby to pass. Even if they did use this minigame before, it's still a popular one, and it's a nice little challenge. Don't think I think this game sucks or anything like that. I think this game sucks. Once you beat the first minigame, you're given the option to either continue the story or head back to Mystery Inc. headquarters. I gotta say, the headquarters look so cozy. I always wanted to live here. This and the ship from the Spongebob movie game are honestly my dream houses. I always loved making Velma repeat this one line because it sounds like a song. Let's continue the mystery. 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 You can also access the computer to see descriptions of the different monsters you'll encounter. It's a nice feature and a good way to keep you engrossed, but let's get back to the story. In the second minigame, you have to clean up after the pterodactyl ghost's attack. You have to reassemble the costumes of the Minor 49er, Captain Cutler, the Skeleton Man, Redbeard, and the Black Knight. It's really amusing, even though I keep confusing Minor 49er pieces for Redbeard ones. It's also shockingly hard to find the Skeleton Man's arms. I was searching for a while before I noticed they were hanging on the wall like this. Good on AWE for adding a bit of a challenge to an otherwise easy mission. We then get this Indiana Jones-inspired map segment where the mystery machine limousine travels back to the headquarters. Seriously, I love saying that. Shaggy and Scooby then share one of my favorite scenes of dialogue from the movie. We have to be more like real detectives. Scooby-Doo, raise your paw and repeat after me. From this day forward, we will no longer be our goofy selves. Run, 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 run. We will be awesome detectives. We will be terrific, fantastic, and spectacular, and cease to be, uh, loserific, lamtastic, and sucktacular. Rara, sucktacular. Meanwhile, Daphne, Fred, and Velma discuss their clues and determine that the pterodactyl ghost couldn't be its original owner since he died during a prison escape. However, his cellmate, Jeremiah Wickles, who happened to be the Black Knight ghost, was recently released. Unfortunately, we don't get to see Scooby and Shaggy show up with Daphne's go-go boots, but we then get to head over to Jeremiah Wickles' manor. Unlike in the movie, this scene takes place at night, which is oddly more fitting for it. He also just has a little monster hanging out in his well out front. Clearly suspicious. When you reach the doorbell, Wickles refuses to let you in. He gets sick of you pressing the doorbell and opens a trap door cinematic. Fred, Daphne, and Velma apparently land on their feet, which is impressive, but not out of character. We then get a very odd minigame where visitors are falling through the trap door and you have to catch them. I'm not sure why this is your problem when you have bigger things to worry about, but okay. And geez, if that many people were coming to my front door, I'd set traps for them too. Some of the guests include what I can only assume are Mormons and Girl Scouts. They're sending the whole faction after Mr. Wickles. They must think a conversion to Mormonism and a box of Girl Scout cookies will convince mean old Wickles to change his ways. Once again, this minigame is taken from Battle for Bikini Bottom, but it's still a fairly standard one. It's also funny to hear the visitors scream in agony when you miss them. <laughs> 
After that unnecessary mission, Shaggy sends Scooby to search the mansion for clues. You take control of Scooby and look for items to build a spook buster with. What's a spook buster, you ask? Well, I... Uh, I guess we'll find out. So Mr. Wickles has ghosts just wandering around his house, so you'd think this would indicate that he's at least a little suspicious. I mean, he's just nonchalantly living in a super haunted house. Never trust anyone who can comfortably coexist with ghosts. So you collect Scooby Snacks to open doors, even standing up to reach higher ones. Monsters like the Tar Monster and Cotton Candy Glob try to stop you, but you're determined to find those Spookbuster pieces. I'm not sure how Scooby Snacks open the doors, but I'm gonna go ahead and assume Scooby molds them together to form the exact key needed to open the lock. Now try to visualize that. It's really fun to explore the mansion, though. The level designers did really good here. There's different stuff in every room, and it actually feels like a legitimate house layout. This is one of my favorite minigames so far. Once you find all the objects you need, you find a clue that says there's a big event called the Faux Ghost happening that same night. Then the Black Knight shows up without any remarkable entrance. Dude, we are detectives. You found an actual clue, Scoob. Like the Black Knight Ghost. <laughs> you finally get to use the Spook Buster in yet another minigame lifted from Battle for Bikini Bottom. You circle enemy ghosts with the mouse to defeat them. I guess Scooby was able to assemble miscellaneous objects into an effective ghost fighting device, so my theory about the Scooby Snack key moldings isn't too far-fetched. Each stage ends with a boss. Minor 49er, Captain Cutler, and the Black Knight require multiple circles to be defeated. It's straightforward, not bad. After you escape the mansion, Shaggy and Scooby decide they want to be good detectives like Fred, Daphne, and Velma, so they go to the faux ghost on their own. Shaggy also makes what might be a very subtle reference to marijuana. Or he can roll the mystery. Bro, have you been eating the lawn again? Weed, grass, lawn, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too adult-minded for this kid's game. The Faux Ghost is an event where criminals busted by Mystery Inc. gather for a celebration. I guess it's like a support group for old people who are taken down by a group of teenagers. You can explore the town, but you have to head to this costume shop to find a disguise. You have to construct outfits that match for Scooby and Shaggy to wear. I'd say this game was also lifted from Battle for Bikini Bottom, but come on, it's a simple dress-up game. I wish it allowed you to mix and match because it would be hilarious to show up in an outfit that just doesn't go together. I also wish it had more silly options to choose from. But the real minigame starts when you get your costumes and head into the faux ghost. You have to go around collecting Scooby snacks and avoiding actual ghosts. Did these ghosts not get the memo? This was for fake ghosts only. Seriously. So why are you collecting Scooby snacks? Why, to challenge the skeleton man in Minor 49er to a dance-off, of course. Yeah, that's... pretty bizarre. Tar Monster and Cotton Candy Glob are also trying to hunt you for some reason. I thought you were in a disguise. Also, remember, everyone here is supposed to be wearing a costume. How the heck is someone disguised as Skeleton Man? Maybe he's remote controlled. Also, you cannot convince me this guy isn't Shaggy. Seriously, look at him. So when you challenge a monster to a dance, you have to click these icons in the correct order to replicate their dance moves. This is so much better than Friday Night Funkin'. Also, I want to eat the icons. Don't lie to me, they look just like little cookies. Once you win the dance off as Scooby, you do the mission again as Shaggy. We are the world famous Wasai Pickle Oculus! You said it, we are the world famous Wasai Pickle Octopus. So you have to win another dance off, and I have to admit, it's so weird seeing a skeleton be defeated without breaking into pieces. It just doesn't feel right. Afterwards, the Black Knight shows up and both Shaggy and Scooby have to beat him. This is hilarious when you consider the Black Knight is old man Wickles in a costume. Even in his old age, with his normally grumpy attitude, he can still kill it on the dance floor. With those moves, why would you ever turn to a life of crime? So after you beat him, the monsters somehow figure out your identity, so you escape through the trash chute. No thanks, I'm actually trying to lose a few pounds. So once you're out, you follow old man Wickles to an old mining town. The point is Wickles has led us into, like, a terrifying ghost town. <laughs> ghost town? Yeah, ghost town. No. I kinda expected a punchline there. By complete coincidence, the other gang members are led to the same mining town through their own research. Small world, huh? You play this minigame where you ride a minecart and shoot enemies as they appear. Reminds me of the minecart game from Mystery Mayhem. Man, I miss that game. 
Again, I hate that the skeletons don't break when you shoot them. Can you even call them skeleton enemies if they don't shatter into a million pieces on impact? After you beat the minigame, you reach this lab and find an old fridge filled with potions. It was lemonade in the movie! So unlike in the film, only Scooby eats a potion and transforms into a monster. So it's up to Shaggy to mix a concoction and turn him back to normal. You have to create antidotes by combining colors to make the same color. I really wish I understood color theory as a kid because this was always a matter of guessing what colors combine to make what. Thankfully, we have the power of Google if we don't understand it. Scooby also has some funny lines whenever he transforms. Yeah, I buff. Well, that's a highly combustible synthesis. Potion. <laughs> Once he's back to normal, a wall blows up for no reason and shows you the way to a secret lab. Then the other gang members show up. Great timing. Then you see that all the costumes of your former adversaries are in the lab. They're being turned into actual monsters, so you steal the control panel as the masked figure shows up and sends his minions after you. You get away by riding a trash can lid down a slope in this really fun minigame. You can jump, spin, and go over ramps as you collect Scooby Snacks. It's great. Then you flee with the others, but the monsters are ravaging the town and you can't go back to your old base because they'll find you there. You head back to your old high school clubhouse in the woods. Man, I wish I had one of those. And two different storylines commence. Scooby and Shaggy reflect on their ineptitude while the others mess with the control panel. By reversing the controls, they realize they can destroy the monsters with it. You get a minigame where you do exactly that, and... A red chip. A yellow chip. A blue chip. Yes, that music is taken right out of all the AWE Spongebob games. Again, they were a low-budget company, so they often use the same resources throughout their media. It's a good song, it's just surprising to hear a Spongebob song in a Scooby-Doo game. This mission is actually pretty cool. You have to assemble the pieces into certain patterns based on their color. Prompts will tell you how many of the correct colors you have and how many are in the right spot. You use this information to deduce what goes where. It's fitting that there would be a game of deduction and a game about detectives. This one gave my child self a lot of trouble, but I can appreciate it. The worst is yet to come. After reversing the controls, Captain Cutler comes out of the lake outside. Yikes! Cap Cutler's ghost! Yes, Captain Cutler is a ghost. Thank you for that observation. In the next minigame, the pterodactyl ghost is ravaging the city and you have to save civilians on your way to the monster hive. This one was really hard for me to figure out. The pterodactyl ghost is always very close to you, so it's hard not to get hit whenever you have to stop and pick someone up. I also didn't realize I needed to open my doors and wait for the civilians to walk in, so I didn't understand why I couldn't pick anyone up at first. It's hard, but not bad once you get the hang of it. Afterwards, you show up at the mining town and the Black Knight arrives on his horse. Fred takes him on, and they somehow agree to a jousting match. So are you ready for the worst minigame in this entire thing? Bring yeah, it isn't explained very well at all. This whole minigame is a continual sequence of asking, what am I supposed to do? Child me could not figure it out for the life of me. Adult me had a hard time figuring it out. I kept losing and couldn't figure out what I was doing right whenever I'd win. You have to win five rounds of this match, and your lance gets heavier and harder to aim every time. That's a bit excessive, in my opinion. It's hard enough to win one round. You're supposed to aim your lance at the knight from afar and hope that the target that appears for a split second lines up with him. But once you figure that out, you're left wondering how you lose rounds that you really should have won. It's not a very refined game, but I can see what the thought here was. It wouldn't be so bad if the instructions were clearer. The difficulty is also sudden and unexpected. No minigames before or after it are nearly as challenging. This gave me more childhood frustration than the Hall of Arms. But no game is perfect, so let's move on. Since Shaggy and Scooby are faster than Velma, she gives them the control panel and sends them to the Monster Hive. You're faster than me. But, but like, we can't. We wanted to be heroes like you, but we're not. Maybe you've been heroes all along. You just haven't known it. Heroes. Heroes. Oh, she sure changed their minds fast. 
The next minigame isn't too bad. You're shaggy and you're running through mines with skeleton men chasing after you. Unfortunately, it's easy for them to corner you when you just have to take a hit and lose a life at multiple intervals. There are times where you can take a separate path to go around them, but they aren't very common. Extra lives are also a little scarce. So you find these computers and play a quick round of trying to make all the lights match up. It's easy, but still, nice to see a deduction game in a story about detectives. These computers open doors and grant you passage to other parts of the stage. At the end, you run past Minor 49er and get away in a minecart. Again, Shaggy, stop telling me how to control my diet. Afterwards, you find Scooby-Doo after he took a shortcut. Then you go on the elevator just in time for the cotton candy glob to show up. Now unfortunately, because this triggers a minigame, it ruins one of my favorite jokes in the entire movie where Shaggy and Scooby easily destroy the monster by eating it. Don't get me wrong, the minigame is fun. You have to eat the cotton candy glob when he isn't looking at you, but was it worth sacrificing the punchline? I'd say so. It's oddly satisfying to watch him slowly dissipate. Remember in the movie when he said he'd give them cavities? Yeah, I think that much cotton candy would give you a few more lethal health concerns. When you reach the lab, you reunite with the other gang members, so they really didn't need to send you ahead since you made it there at around the same time. You then play a matching minigame with the monsters you've encountered. This is how you disable the machine and stop it from creating more monsters. It's creative, and I like how you have to scroll to different screens to find a few matchups. Finally, the masked figure unleashes the tar monster to attack your friends and flood the whole place with tar. You take control of Scooby and have to find computers to activate moving platforms. You have to jump across tar to other platforms, but the jump controls are a little stiff. It took a bit for me to figure it out, but you have to click exactly where you want to go for Scooby to jump to it. It's easy once you figure that out. Very straightforward for the final minigame. Once you win, the control panel blows up and all the monsters die. You then apprehend the masked figure and win the game. But wait! You can enter a bonus password to unlock a secret final stage. This is how you get the true ending. Velma, Daphne, and Fred hold a dance-off with the masked figure. Scooby and Shaggy join in too. Check it out, Velma's got the moves. And this is basically the ending. Now if you haven't seen the movie, you'd be very confused. It seems like a lot of story points go unresolved. You don't find out who the masked figure is, you never find out how Old Man Wickles is related to this, and the original pterodactyl ghost is still dead. I guess he won't be stealing anyone's tater tots anymore. Patrick was also removed from this game, which makes sense since he didn't affect the story that much, but this ending does feel incomplete on its own. I guess that's why they keep showing you pictures from the actual movie. If you want the story, you're gonna have to watch it the old-fashioned way. That aside, I like this game. I liked it as a child, and it holds up for me all these years later. Some of the minigames are really fun, and it's nice that they are able to include some of the humor from the movie. It's a decent adaptation that's pleasing to look at with some really good level designs. There's a lot of variety here. You can tell they put a lot of effort into it, even if they did borrow elements from the Spongebob games. This came out a year after Battle for Bikini Bottom, so they likely still had some of the programming on file. Might as well use it. From my own experience, I gotta say kids would enjoy this. It's just the right amount of challenging, only becoming a little too excessive in certain areas. The Black Knight fight needed a little more work, and the skeleton maze could have made the enemies a little more avoidable. That aside, I can't complain too much. It's good. Low budget or not, AWE really knew how to work with what they had. That's really admirable, and one of the reasons I still appreciate this small company after all these years. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.